Hi everybody, I'm here today with um, Catherine Morgan or Katie as everybody affectionately knows her. You know, uh, probably the OG Valley YouTube star, uh, former NYCV soloist and soon to be Miami Miami City Valley, is that correct? Yes. Miami City Valley soloist and I'm really yes. excited to talk to her. I've been following her for a while and so many people have said so many nice things about her so I'm very excited to talk to her and have have and have you guys hear her insights um so before we start i always like to ask this fun question which is what did you have for breakfast today for breakfast today i ended up having yogurt and berries actually which is kind of typical for me i either do that or like eggs and gluten-free toast i'm a gluten-free girl so i uh eat one or the other <laughs> is it an intolerance yes it's an intolerance actually i figured this out not too long ago um i was Anytime I have gluten, it just like my feet swell up, my ankles swell up, and my back was breaking out like crazy. And so I just stopped gluten for a while, and everything stopped. Like the swelling went down, my back cleared up. It was bizarre. So I don't have celiac, but I do have an intolerance to it. So I like to avoid it uh, most of the time. But there are lots of um, good gluten-free substitutes. Oh, now, it's you know, so especially easy Especially in New York. Yes, yeah, it's so easy now. So... So yeah, you would barely miss the bread and cake. Right, right. I mean, I mean, there's some. They're more probably more gluten free bakeries here than normal bakeries. So, right, because um, it's New York. Yes, and I apologize to the listeners. I am getting over the flu, so I sound horrendous. So that's why I sound a little weird. Just so they know. No, I think you sound lovely. Oh, thank you. So. <laughs> um. So one thing I wanted to. I think everybody kind of knows your story from how you were. Um, you know, at NYCV Solo was on the rise and your thyroid problems did that to you too. But um, I think I would like you to, if you don't mind, tell your story in your own words so that maybe the people who are not so familiar can hear about it because I right. think it's a very incredible story. Oh, thank you. I, um, from a very young age, knew I always wanted to be a ballerina. Like that was, it was the thing for me. People would say, when did you know? I just always knew. It was never going to be mm. anything else. So when I was 15, I got accepted to the year-round program at the School of American Ballet here in New York, and I moved up with my mom, and for two years I was there, and at 17, I was hired into New York City Ballet, and everything was incredible. They kind of threw me in the deep end, to be honest, with so many wonderful roles, and um, I danced Juliet at 17, I did Sugar Plum, my second Nutcracker at 19, I did Aurora at 20. Um, and I was promoted to soloist at 21, I believe. And mm. I remember even Peter Martins pulling me aside and saying, you know, work on this and this, but you'll eventually be a principal. You just have to pay your dues. You just have to work on it. So I was on the track to being a principal, and everything was great. But then around about spring season of 2010, um, I had been promoted that previous October, I started to just get really, really tired in rehearsals. And I thought it was because he was doing a new ballet. We were rehearsing six hours a day plus shows. I mean, you know, dancers get tired. But this was yeah. tired to the point that I could barely get through the day without a nap. And then my hair started falling out. I remember Romeo was on that season, and, and I went down to the hair guy because every time he did Juliet, he did the braids for you. And I went down to the hair room, and he was like, where's your hair? Like, I, I have nothing to braid. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, half your hair is gone, um, which was terrifying. And then I would just be in the shower, and clumps were coming out. And then, oh. dancing 10 hours a day, I started putting on weight like crazy. And it just made no sense. And they weren't talking to me going, you know, are you aware that you're putting on weight? And I wanted to go, no, I had no idea. You know, um, <laughs> not a clue. No, I mean, it was, it was terrifying. And I said, I don't, mm. I don't know what this is. So I managed to get through the season, and then just the weight piled on. I gained 45 pounds in six weeks, for, which for a ballet dancer, when you are dancing 10 hours a day, six days a week, makes no sense. Yeah. So I thought, this is, this, something is wacky. So everybody said, well, maybe you have mono, since you're so tired, and um, go to the doctor, see what happens. And so... I did. So I went to the doctor, and <clears throat> they said, no, it's actually not mono. It's your thyroid. And I said, what is that? And they said, it's your thyroid gland, and it's basically not functioning. 
And I said, okay. Mm-hmm. And your thyroid gland, your thyroid gland affects everything, your hair, your weight, your energy. So they were like, well, take this medication. You'll be fine. And I was like, great, wonderful. Fast forward two years, I'm still sick as a dog, big as a house, and nothing is working. And they kept trying to cast me in things, and I had to pull out of them, or I'd go down to the costume house, and I couldn't get the costume closed, which was humiliating. So finally, after two years, I said, I cannot do this anymore. Like, I am so miserable and unhappy. I'm going to have to let my contract run out and just leave the company so I can go home and get well. Mm -hmm. So I did. And I thought it was going to be a case of three months, you know, I'll be done. Three months, I'll be great. Back on stage. Fast forward another three years <laughs> and eight doctors later. Um, we still hadn't quite figured out because all these doctors were looking at me as this girl, even though I put on 45 pounds. Ballerina's putting on 45 pounds. That's nothing. Like, you still look normal. Quote, normal. Yeah. So they were like, they thought I was making it up. So finally, I found this one doctor that took me seriously and said, yes, you are still small, but for you, the rate of change, you know, they actually listened. And then he started testing for autoimmune illnesses. Why no one tested for an autoimmune illness before this, I don't know. And they found out it was not only my thyroid, but Hashimoto's, which is where your body attacks itself. So no matter how much medication you're giving yourself, it's not working. So then I started, like, tweaking my diet and just trying to focus on other things other than just this medication. And during this healing process, when you're sick and bored, you watch YouTube videos. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> which you know, so I started watching YouTube videos, and that's when it occurred to me there were no dancers on YouTube, or if there were some dancers, they were like 12 year olds giving you know bad advice. So I thought, well, I can do this. This is something to kill time, keeps me relevant. So I started this YouTube channel really catering to my younger self. What would I want to learn from the New York City Ballet Dancer? And it kind of blew up. I, from that, I started writing for Dance Period Magazine. I started judging Youth American Grand Prix. I started all these little extra projects that just kind of came out of this YouTube channel. And I became known as like the ballet advice guru. And it kept me relevant in the, in the ballet world. And I started teaching a lot. And so it was almost like I developed this plan B second career off of YouTube. And at that point, I thought, well, I'm happy doing this. I'm making a living doing this. My body, I was, try, I was doing gigs here and there, but I was still not in shape. And I was still, it was not, you know, Catherine Morgan of New York City Ballet quality. So I just kind of developed this plan B and then during this time I met what is now who is now my ex-husband um and <clears throat> that's a very long story but long story short we were married for 10 months and I found out it was all a lie so after that painful process which was which is excruciating it was even more painful than the illness because it was like I had yeah. been tricked I had been duped I had put all of my trust and all of my faith into this person and it completely mm-hmm. broke my heart and so after that, to get through it and to get through that pain, I got back in the studio. And all the weight came off, the medication. I, I'm off all medication because I, I went to the doctor for a checkup, and he said, your numbers are the best I've ever seen them. I don't know what happened. So I got back in the studio. I got back in shape. And it was like, oh, okay, <laughs> here we are. And it's been seven years since I've been in the company. And so I now, updating, I contacted Lourdes Lopez of Miami City because it was one of my top choices. They they are smaller, which I appreciate, um, but they still have the great rep that New York City Ballet does. Um, Balanchine yeah. Robinson. They're very, very American yeah. company. Yeah. And they do a classic every year. We're doing Don Q this year. So I contacted her. I said, um, I don't know if you have any spots. I don't even know if you remember me. She said, I absolutely remember you. Please come and I'll, you know, come take class with us for a few days, see if you like the company, blah, blah, blah. So I went for four days down there. And even when I was down there, it was completely mind-blowing to me that a, a year ago I was not even dancing. And now uh, here I am in shape auditioning for Miami City Ballet. Like, it was nuts. And um, she said, well, I'll, you know, we're kind of sh- in the middle of budgets and shifting things around, and I'll contact you. And then on April 1st, she called me up and said, I have a spot. We'd love for you to join the company as a soloist. I about had a heart attack. At first, I wanted to go, okay, this April Fool's Day, are you sure? Is this some kind of joke? <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
No, they would be like, April Fool's. Yeah, April you're, Fools. You're principal. Oh, well, yeah. You're a principal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and she said, you know, you will dance principal roles, but I want to make the transition easy for you, easier for you coming yeah. in as a soloist. I said, I that don't want to come in yeah. as a principal. Let me come in as a soloist. Because um, it's been seven years. So um, we just had a lovely talk. She's amazing. Company's amazing. And I got my contract a year to the day that I found out about my marriage being a wife. So that was a bit odd um, and like very full circle. So now I'm yeah, still, that's... she wants me to keep the YouTube. She wants me to keep everything, which is such a blessing. And so now I've kind of come full circle. Plan B is still there, but now I'm going back into the company. So it's, it's truly incredible. If you would have told me this a year ago, I'd be sitting here joining the company. I would have told you were nuts. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank I think. you. Everybody who follows you is very excited for your new journey. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited. Um, so, you know, when you hear like the Cliff Notes version of it, which you just gave me, it sounds, you know, it sounds all very smooth. Like, yeah, well, some small, there were some bumps, but you overcome it. You know, when you hear somebody's story in just like a couple of minutes, it sounds amazing. But behind that, it's actually a lot of struggle and a lot Ooh, of downtime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, from diagnosis, it, I was diagnosed nine years ago so it's been it's been a long haul <laughs> and I yeah, can tell you because... the person that would tell you it was really long was my mother my mother was, it would sit here and go oh my gosh <laughs> thought we were gonna die <laughs> um but yeah no it's it's been a long process yeah I think people don't know people when they look at somebody from the outside especially with like social media don't realize that you know beneath everything to get to where you know, to, to where you are now, there was like a lot of, because like you said, it was seven years. Seven years. There was a lot. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a long time to mm -hmm. have to deal with all your issues and everything. Obviously, when you started your YouTube channel, it wasn't like instantly famous. So mm -hmm. um, what were you doing in interim period? Like how were you coping with, you know, being sick and, um, you know, yeah, I think just like getting through day to day. That was hard because when I, funnily enough though, because of, when I left the company, I was so sick. It was almost a relief. Mm. So for a little while, I was happy just to be out of there and to be a normal person and just to not have to start. Because I was literally barely eating by the end because I was trying to get all this weight off because I didn't know why it had, yep, yep. had come on. So just to be able yep. to like eat normally again and just be a person for a second. But then after a few months, it hit me that the career I had worked for for, for so long was gone. Um, so for me, it was spending time with family my parents helped I ended up getting a dog which really helped with my first little dog her name was, oh yes her I name think was Duchess. I agree it. yeah as somebody who has struggled with depression I can tell you dogs very helpful that was my doctor's one of his his things he was like okay I'm gonna put you on medication and I want you to get a dog and I was like okay <laughs> so that helped you know just just spending time with family and and the biggest thing for me was realizing that I was still valuable even though I wasn't dancing because I think as dancers mm -hmm. we only value ourselves based on our last performance based on how thin we are based on how well we're doing and for the first time in my life I wasn't doing any of that so I had to yeah. it was a long process to figure out okay wait I'm still valuable and I'm still um, worthy even though I'm not a dancer and as a friend of mine used to say you're a human being not a human dancing you know remember yeah. you're a human being and that took a long time um, so it was just a matter of day to day, you know, keeping busy. I was very fortunate in that um, I had some leeway room with the amount of money I was paid at New York City Valley that I didn't have to like immediately find a job, um, which then of course became YouTube and everything. But I, t I started teaching, which I was also the person that hate. I was like, I'm never going to teach. I'm I'm never going to teach. <laughs> and then my look, my home ballet school was like, why don't you come and just sub for us? And I was like, no, 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 no. They said, no, just just come and then that developed a whole love of teaching which I think ended up helping my dancing because you have to learn how to explain things and you have yeah. to learn how to why why isn't this working and you have to tell them why it's not working and so it helps you as a dancer too so I had all these little things that I'd never done before and then YouTube hit and that became that became it so but it was just being kind to myself and going it's okay that I'm not dancing I'm still a worthy person so, and um, you know, I think a lot of dancers struggle with this. You know, when they're injured, 
you know, suddenly they're not dancing. Mm-hmm. And, or like you said, when your career ends for a reason and then you feel that your identity is lost. Yes. Did you feel, um, you know, <laughs> did you feel like you had to fill up with this emptiness with something? And did you feel like there was an urgency to like be worthy in another way? Like, oh, I have to find a new career. I have to do something to, you know, figure yeah, it out. I did. Like I mean, worthy yeah. again. Get- yeah, I think that's the other thing is because I absolutely did because when when you're a professional dancer at 17 and you're you're on the stage being an adult at 17, like you we are so driven, <clears throat> we are so overachievers that that's innate in, in dance. you can't be a lazy dancer. Like it's just it's a career it's a career yeah, perfectionist absolutely. really. Absolutely. So I felt like that was one of the the self-esteem things is like okay, you failed. So now you have mm-hmm. to do something else. Um, and I, I will give a lot of credit to my parents that they weren't going to let me sit around feeling miserable for myself for very long. I mean, they said, okay, you, you're allowed a month or two of misery, but I could see my father starting to be like, okay, you, we need to do something with this chick. <laughs> like, she's <laughs> right. like, I'm not going to allow this. So I did, and that's I'm, I'm very fortunate in that I have that personality. I think most dancers do is that we have to achieve something, and that's why dancers yeah, yeah. do so well even when they stop. I mean, I had three people in my SAB class getting to Harvard. Like, it's, you know, so yeah. I felt like I had to still achieve something because I was only 21 at the time, 22, and I was mm. like, I'm still a baby, and I feel like I failed. This is not okay. I have to do something. So... You know, now seven years on, did you ever find a place where it's like, has the word achievement changed for you? As in, you know, I'm sure when you're 21, it was a lot of material, like <laughs> tangible accomplishments. Like I have to, yeah, I was a soloist. How do I replace that with something else outside of ballet that's equally worthy? For you, has the idea of achievement changed in that sense? Yeah, and I think also going into it this time, little things that were so important last time are not as important as this time. Like who's doing what and what cast am I of this? And, you know, what are they, is that, what's everybody thinking of me? And, um, you know, stuff like that, that it's like that little stuff, it doesn't matter what cast you are. If you're third cast, because I was third cast Juliet, and I was all freaked out about being third cast. If you're third cast, right. you're still going to get a show, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. It, the little things like that don't matter as much this time. Um, but I think my sense of achievement, especially for a while, was just getting through a day. Um, especially when I was right. sick, like if all I could do that day was tondus. I did plies and tondus. If that was it, great. Um, and I think I have a much healthier approach to things now because for me it was a kind of black and white, all or nothing mentality when I was dancing. Yeah, yeah. Like if, I can relate to that. And if one thing went wrong in a show, the whole show, it was like, no, nope, it was terrible. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. When half <laughs> yeah. the time no one saw it anyway. Um, no, you focus on like the one negative yeah. thing instead of like oh yeah everything else good that happened, right? Oh yeah. yes. Did you see the one pirouette? And people are like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah. So little things like that. Now I'm able to go. Oh, it's okay. Or if I had a bad ballet class, it was like the whole day was shot. I was very much a black or white mentality. And I think now if I have a bad class, well, that's all right. I'm here. I'm dancing. Every every step is a gift now. Because I, I truly, a year ago, thought I was done. I mean, I hadn't put on point shoes up until, I would say, May of last year. I hadn't put on point shoes for three, three years, other than for YouTube. So the fact that I'm joining a professional top five in America ballet company, and I hadn't put on point shoes for three years, like, it's, it's, I, like, tondus are a gift to me. Um, and, you know... Obviously, when you started a YouTuber, it wasn't like instant full time YouTuber. It wasn't like that. So, what was what were your first videos? Were they? They were I was like looking at channel. Was it makeup videos? Yeah, they were so bad. <laughs> they were so bad. But I think the reason I started with makeup videos <clears throat> was for two reasons. Number one is I always was known for my beautiful stage makeup. People would comment on how good my stage makeup was. So I thought, well, that's that's a good way to start. And it was neck up. And at that point, I was right. so ill and I was so self conscious about my body that neck up was all I could handle. So I started with the stage makeup, and then it turned into advice videos, still neck up, and um, kind of just snowballed from there, but I did not know what I was doing. I still do all of my own editing, all of my own filming. I have yeah, no yeah. assistant. Um, but that, back then, it was literally 
let's try this. I have no idea. I like I had a bad sh- half sheet hanging in the background of the front, like so bad. <laughs> So at, at least you put up the sheet, so that, I think that's a sign of your, I think that's a sign of your perfectionism, <laughs> wanting to make sure that the yeah. backdrop looked a decent sheet. Yeah. Oh man. Um, but you know, and then they develop over time, and you you know you learn from it. But and I had no schedule of videos. I was just kind of making them, and I didn't just even kind of know. Out as you go, yeah. And people thought I was crazy. My mother even just the other day she said to me, "I have to tell you." I, when you first started your YouTube channel, I thought you were crazy. Like, I didn't know how you were possibly going to do anything with this. She said, and now look at you. I'm so proud of you. She said, now I get it. I'm like, good, Mom. Thanks. But, she, you know, they, people thought I was nuts. Because I can relate it, to that. Right? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure with you, people thought you were crazy, and now look at you, you know. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, and so it was just kind of for fun, really, and to kill time and to make myself feel relevant again. And... The biggest thing was to tell my story because a lot of people thought I was fired from New York City Valley, which was not the case. So I wanted to yeah, clarify yeah. to people that I was not fired. I left of my own accord. Um, so that ended up <clears throat> being a very good thing. Which came first? You, you had a blog as well, I remember previously. Did the blog come first or did the YouTube channel come first? I think the blog came first because I... A while ago, while I was still in the company, I would post little notes on Facebook. Do you remember, like, the notes you could post? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so then that turned into a blog. People were like, oh, you should start a blog because your notes are really great. So then I started a blog. I think it was called If the Point Shoe Fits, which doesn't exist anymore. It just turned into my website, which is katherinemorganonline.com. But then the, then I just, people were like, well, you should do videos. So then I added the video. So I think the blog actually came first now that you say that. Yeah. Oh, so, like, what were you writing? Was it the same sort of advice videos or just day-to-day life? Little things, like, um, I think some of my first notes on Facebook and posts were things like summer course advice, um, audition advice, um, and then little technique notes, like I would write my tips for pirouettes or turnout, but it's really hard because ballet is so visual. It's hard to mm-hmm. just type it out in a blog post yeah, and yeah. have people get it. So that's why the, the videos are... Was, was the natural next step because there's only so far you can go in blog posts. But just, I mean, I literally, once I started my YouTube channel, I took those notes and made videos out of them. So I had already had content. And um, when did you decide to start becoming more personable with your videos? You know, I, I looked at your channel, I noticed it was like makeup, and then after that, like some advice, and then slowly it became more of you like sharing your story. When did you decide to do that, and how do you sort of draw the line for your own? Because obviously you have to um, protect yourself as well. Right, I think... Preserve your sanity. Exactly. I think it just came when people were starting to be more interested in me, because at first it was... I didn't know if people were going to like it. I didn't know if people were going to watch it. So I just put very basic. And I was even so, like, mannequin in those videos. Hi, everyone. It's Katie. Like, I talked like this. And (laughs) I could see over time if I go back and watch them. I think it was when I started adding Q&As in, when they started submitting Mm -hmm. questions that you open up a little bit. And then they wanted to know the, the illness story, so that opened me up a little bit. And then people really started to care because they would reach out to me and say, oh, I have the same thing, or I was inspired by your story. So then you feel, okay, it's safe to share a little bit more. And then at one point, you know, it was, are you single? And at the time, I was not. And so that opened up into the relationship, which then turned into the wedding, which turned into all this stuff. And so it just kind of gradually came over time. Which is why then the hard part was when my marriage ended, I couldn't yeah. just not talk about it. Like, all of a sudden, I wasn't yeah. wearing my wedding ring. And people are like, where's your wedding ring? So then you have to tell about that stuff, too. But I think it's in those moments and the painful moments that people really, you see who the real supporters are. And I, I truly have the best viewers. I rarely get a nasty comment, which is very, very rare. Um, I'll occasionally get the, you have no idea what you're talking about, or you're a has-been, or um, many times I got on older videos, you are fat. But other, the very, even oh, that's those, terrible. Oh, yeah. But they're just trolls on the internet that just have nothing better to do. And But even then, it was very, very rare that I get bad comments. And I think because I am positive and I don't, I try not to be too controversial, I I don't know. I it, I think it's something about everybody who follows me just wants a positive environment, and so I I'm very blessed, and my followers are are they're very positive. So, 
Um, and did you feel any sort of, I guess, pressure because maybe people are expecting of you like, oh, I want to see content from Katie or when people start asking about your, you know, your wedding ring and maybe you're mm-hmm. not ready to talk about it yet, but you feel like, oh, I had to at some point let people know because they're following me. Did you feel that pressure? Or? A little bit because it, I, when it first happened, um, I, I could not be on camera because I was so humiliated. So I just, yeah. I just, there was a big long gap of no videos and people started reaching out to me. Are you okay? Are you sick? So I think I put something on Instagram going through a rough time. I'll tell you when I'm ready. And actually the, the biggest thing I was waiting for was for the divorce to be finalized because even yeah. one of my lawyers said, you know, even though you are completely not in the wrong here, he could take this and twist it and like it just don't uh, post anything till it's final mm, mm, so that's yeah. why I couldn't and that's why there was such a long gap um but it was finalized on Labor Day and so like immediately the next day I was like okay here's what happened here's where I've been let's move forward because by that point I was okay that was six months yeah. later and yeah, yeah. um at that point I had even gotten back in the studio and the other thing was I hadn't done a video in so long and I had dropped so much weight just getting back in shape and through the trauma of it all, the people were like, "What? whoa, you look totally different. So I did have to address it. Um, and I wanted to address it, but thankfully I was, when I did address it, I was ready to. Um, yeah. But I did have to wait for everything to be finalized before I could. Well, I mean, it was a, you know, without getting into it, it sounds like it was a very difficult period. And I think yeah. the fact that you're able to sort of talk about it now, you know, and share, you know, it, in such a you know calm and I think it speaks a lot to your strength. Oh, and thank how you. Much you've managed thank to you. go because I'm sh- I'm sure it was not easy. It was the worst couple of months of my life, honestly. Yep, it was bad. But you know, but here we are, now. and and you know what? And that's why yeah, people, we survived. If it hadn't happened, I wouldn't be joining Miami City Ballet because I would have just yeah. stayed married. I wouldn't have danced. I, you know, it's almost like I had to go through it to get here. So yeah, I think that's the thing about. Um, I mean, that's personally what I believe is that when there's like a very difficult challenge and you can, and in the moment it's the most awful and terrible thing, but if you have the strength, mm-hmm. you know, if you just keep putting one, one foot in front of you and getting through it, you sort of look back and realize that, um, you know, the fact that it's not about the thing that happened, but the fact that you managed to find it and you to get over it eventually serves you well and makes you a stronger person. Yes, I totally you agree. To something about yourself. Um, so do you ever feel like you made it as a maybe as a YouTuber or like as a dancer? Did you have a point where you feel like I've made it? Oh, um, not. I mean, there's always you're always wanting to achieve more. I think that's the thing about being a dancer. Yeah, I will yeah, yeah. say there were several roles that when I did them, I was like, now I feel validated. Not even Juliet the first time because I was still so young when I did it that I was clueless. Doing Sugar Plum for the first time because it's so iconic at New York City Ballet, like that was one of them. Mm. And doing Aurora because what if you're cast to do Aurora in a big ballet company, you know, okay, I must be doing something right. <laughs> like this, right? It is yeah, yeah, the yeah. hardest role. And when I was the only soloist that did it in a sea of, I think it was like five principals and me, I was like, okay, I must be doing, you know, I must be doing okay. Um, so it was really Sugar Plum and Aurora, and also Scotch Symphony. That was another one. It's not as well known, but I loved that role. Was so me, and doing that role, I was like, okay, this is yeah. And then as a YouTuber, you know, I felt it was really proud when I hit 100,000 subscribers. I mean, granted, there are people on YouTube with millions of subscribers, but and I only have 150 something thousand at this point. That's that's impressive. It's still really good. <laughs> it's still really good for ballet, especially. But um, especially yeah, it's such a niche industry, yeah, I mean, right? Even I think Claudia Dean is the other other big one. She's got one hundred and seventy yeah, yeah. something thousand. And she's she I love her so much. We want to collaborate. She is she and I Please work do. so well together because she her channel is totally different than mine. Yet it's yeah all about ballet and she's a professional. So if you watch go if you don't know about Claudia Dean, go watch Claudia Dean. But um, I I think just. When people come up to me in random places and say, I love your videos and this and that, I'm always surprised when someone knows who I am and I forget. So I'll be like a YAGP judging and I forget that everybody knows who I am. So I'm just sitting there and I'm like, oh, you have to keep your face straight. Okay, you can't look bad. You have to like put makeup on and like, you know, or I'll be somewhere. I just random, random, like 
I can't go into a dance store anymore. I, that's when I forget to. I'll just go into a dance store because I need something. And it's like, <gasps> I'm like, what? What? Who's here? Where? And it's me. But I forget because <laughs> I don't have that mentality. So it's just the, the far, as far as these videos reach. You know, I have people in Germany and Brazil and everywhere. It's crazy to me. Um, and I think for a ballet channel, I'm doing pretty darn well. So. I think so too. Like I said, you are like the or people kind of know you as the OG ballet YouTuber. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's very nice as well that, and I think it's, um, and I think what that's the important part of the ballet community is like when you talk about Claudia, because I think it's important for people to recognize it. Like there's space for all of us. Absolutely, it's, there's a niche for everybody. I mean, her videos are so educational. Yet she uses students. She use. I mean, she has a totally different approach than I do. I tell people all the time she's a better teacher than I am because she's so good at coaching. So if you want coaching, follow her. You know, mine's are different because I have commentary. I have stories from New York City Ballet as opposed to the Royal Ballet. I have the American training as opposed to the Australian or the British training. So it's, we, we fit well together. Like, there's doesn't have to be her or me, you know? Yeah, Watch exactly. everybody. And it's like, and it's like if you if we sort of learn to collaborate and don't see each other's competition, mm -hmm. like whether it's a business or like YouTube, I mean, it's all businesses, it's different kinds, but that's, you know, when we help each other to grow together and we kind of, it's the idea of lifting each other up, I think. Exactly. Exactly. Really important to keep in mind. Um, so did you ever, you know, you know, there was a point you're doing well with YouTube and you had your gigs and your guestings and your judging at that point, did you feel like, okay, I'm letting go of the idea of dancing ballet full time. Yeah, it was right before I got married, actually, um, which was I got married in 2017. So it was about two years ago that I, I think I even said it on my vlog channel, which now has been deleted because it was all marriage life vlogs, yeah. and I just had to get rid of it. Um, I even said to my viewers, you know, I, I'm really in a good place. I feel like if I go back to dancing, this will go away. I've kind of resigned myself to the fact that I'll never dance again. My body doesn't want to dance again and so I was convinced and it was you know it was heartbreaking in a way but I was good about, I was happy about it I was in a good place yeah um <clears throat> which is why you know this is still crazy to me <laughs> like whoa <laughs> um yeah and the fact that you know Lourdes Lopez does want me to keep my channel and she does want me yeah. to work with the company and she says don't delete stuff like why would you you know she gets it and I'm so grateful that yeah, grateful for she, that. Yeah, I think it's uh, very wise of a director to recognize that you know, having having you know um, you or any other dancers sharing about your experiences, especially the way you do, which is very positive, and you know where the line is. It can only help the company because then people get interested in what people are doing at Miami City Ballet based on you know what you show them. That's the that's the goal. And I even told her, I said, look, I want to show the other dancers I would love to show her like I don't want it to just be about me at Miami I yeah. want it to be about the whole company and actually what's really great to me is she she said to me I saw her at the YGP finals once I was hired she said I kind of didn't really know about all of this um I I would love to use all your YouTube but I had no idea because I think she's so you know ballet company directors are so in their own bubble so yeah. I, it was great for me because I realized she hired me for me as a dancer and not because of my YouTube. Yeah. She And she said that. She's like, I hired you because of your talent, not because, oh, Katie has a large YouTube channel. Yeah. So that was that was nice to hear that she yeah, didn't sure. really know about everything. Because um, that was always a concern of mine wherever I was going to dance. So I wanted to make sure people wanted me for my dancing and not just for what I could, you know. For your following. Name. Yeah. yeah. So, that's nice. Yeah. Although, I know, I have to say, if, you know, com even if somebody was hiring you a little bit for your following as well, I don't think, I think you should still give yourself credit because... It's oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it helps. It does help. But uh, honestly, that the following I have partially comes from the fact that I was a soloist with New York City Ballet to begin with. So, I think the hard work and the, and the dedication yeah, as exactly. a dancer led to this. So, yeah, I mean, it all, it all works together. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, if I can help the company, I'd love to because they are a great company and the dancers are so I think the dancers of Miami sometimes are so underappreciated because I was literally watching them rehearse Four Temperaments while I was there and I was like, oh my gosh, they look incredible. Like they, this is how this should be danced. So um, I'm excited to work with all of them. 
Yeah, and they have um, a few um, SAB people and a lot from NYCB as well, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. um, Lauren, Lauren Vayet. Yes, know. yes, she was with New York City Ballet. Then she was a principal with Pennsylvania, I believe, and then went is now a principal soloist with Miami. She's stunning. Alexander Peters is there. Alex is amazing. Um, I have two people I went to SAB with who are there: Helen Ruiz and Amir Yogev. Um, he's in the core, they're both in the core. Um, who else is there? There's so many. Just I feel like Miami, co- you know, is direct with SAB, and it's just I know a lot. I was surprised at how many people I knew. I didn't expect it. And then actually, one of my dearest friends, who I've known since I was 12, Samantha Galler. She's not SAB, but we met at 12 at CPYB in the right. summer, and uh, I've known her forever. And she's also a soloist, so it's like that's going to be great for me to finally come full circle with her because we went to this summer course together when we were 12 and have kept up ever since. And there are some pretty hilarious photos that I'm sure will be posted somewhere. <laughs> some yes, point. yes, yes, please. I think we would all like to yeah, see. Yeah, I think you'd like to see those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Braces and all. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I actually, this is a good time to say something, which is I actually wanted to talk to you um, and hear you talk about American, the American style, the balance sheet style of ballet, mm-hmm. because nowadays, um, especially, you know, with the rise of Instagram and social media, people are especially drawn to, you know, different styles, like the Russian style, and some people might say, oh, the American style is not as nice or as beautiful, mm-hmm. but I, but I would like, so I would really like to hear from you, because, you know, what are the good qualities about the American style? The American style, I think for, for me, the biggest thing that I learned about balancing the American style was the freedom. It's not, it's not about perfect positions, which is good for someone like me, who I'm more about the freedom and the artistry. I, I'm right. never going to give you the perfect positions. Um, and I think a lot of people forget that balancing is Russian or was Russian. Yeah. And so the, a lot of the style is actually based off the Russian style. It just takes it to the extreme. And there are so many, when SAB was founded, and even when I was there, there were so many Russian teachers. Yeah. Um, it's just the phrase I heard more than anything was more, 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 bigger, 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 you know. Um, and even like the pirouette from the straight back leg, the reason we do the straight back leg is he wanted it to be a surprise. The two bent knees gives it away that I'm going to turn. Straight right. back leg, maybe I'm not going to turn. Maybe I will. That's what he, you know, that's what we were taught that he wanted. Um, and so it's just about that bigger. Sometimes I will say it has now been exaggerated to the point that's not good, like the hands. Yeah. Sometimes now the hands are starting to turn into claws when the whole point of it was just to see all the fingers. Yeah. So things have kind of been extrapolated a little bit. But the whole point of the American style is just... So the people, and this is another thing we heard all the time, people in the fourth ring, people in the back of the theater have to be able to see you. And if you're like yeah. this, with your fingers all bunched up together, they're never going to see it. Yeah. So you have to move more, bigger. And the other thing is musicality. We at New York City Ballet never changed the as, as written tempos for ourselves. Peter was very big on that, and I believe Balanchine was too. That so However the composer wrote the piece, that's how we did it. Yep. Um, we don't change it because oh the ballerina needs it slower like no we you keep up what's your problem keep up that's how, that's how <laughs> she wanted it keep up um, and the conductors we follow the conductor the conductor does not follow us so that was another big thing it's just musicality and artistry which is my way of dancing and I knew that going into it I knew that I was even when I did Sleeping Beauty my Sleeping Beauty is not perfect pure classical sleeping beauty just that's not how I'm trained um it's not my you know perfect strength um and so I think it's just about that it's about the dancing and the movement and the freedom is really the American style and made everything bigger that's that's kind of what I got when I was there yeah interesting you know you talk about um how things have been extrapolated like um Mm -hmm. like I you know from the hand being able to see all the fingers to becoming a claw and I do you find that it's like a trend with ballet now where it's sort of moving towards sort of extremes your leg has to be up there you know your yeah. hands to be exaggerated <laughs> does that worry you a bit or do you yeah find and you know you know where I think it's coming from a lot of that's coming from Instagram I and I've, so kind too. Of, I've kind of ranted about this on my YouTube granted I have an Instagram most people I know do 
But what's happening now is the younger kids, and I'm so grateful we didn't have Instagram when I was little, because they see these pictures of like kids like with their legs around their ears, and that's that's what they think it has to be now. Well, my leg doesn't go up to my ear, so am I going to be a dancer? I'm like, well, mine doesn't either. And I was just always the New York City Ballet. So, um, but what they have to remember is number one was the photo edited you know, photoshopped. Number two, did they whack it and get the picture or can they actually pay it beautifully and hold it there? Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? It's so the thing. And I think that's where this is coming from now is this kind of Instagram instant, like I have to look like that in order to succeed. And it's like, okay, great. Have you seen them dance? Yeah. You know. And do you find um, sometimes, you know, I think that with Instagram that goes as well for like dancers who do lots of tricks and you just see them do lots of pirouettes and it's great that you can do that many pirouettes but it's like mm-hmm. is that all but you don't have but you don't have to be able to do like 11 in a row no you don't dances. no you don't and if you can do 11 pirouettes and make them beautiful and stay on the music great if you're late if you're like wobbling around and don't end it well i don't care if you do 11 pirouettes yeah you know it's like okay great whoop do do you know too beautiful and land that's what I love to see. Instead of 11 hop around, maybe kind of sort of your arms are bent, you know. Um, but the people who can do it beautifully, I mean, go for it. If you can do 11 yeah, exactly. pirouettes, like, go for it. Um, I was actually the YGP gala, and uh, principal with the Bolshoi, he's Korean. I don't, I don't want to pronounce Kim, his name. No. Yes. Kim Kim. Unbelievable, because he did he's, everything. He's nuts. Oh, he's nuts. Everything beautifully, yet on the music with artistry. And I'm sitting there going, yes, thank you. Like, this is a trickster who makes it beautiful, you know? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I just had to I had to talk about him. He was crazy. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, so saw, I saw like, him dance before. It's nuts. It's, it's nuts. crazy. <laughs> it's nuts. And that, if you can that, do that. That's, mm-hmm. that's my valley boyfriend. He just doesn't know it yet. Oh, he doesn't know it? Okay. That's yeah, nice. but, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get him around to it. And he just, and I saw him, because I, I had to coach a student for the final round, too, and I saw him backstage. He's just he's just normal and saying hi to everybody. And I was like, oh, that's so nice to see. And then he does that in the gala, and I'm like, wow, what a star. <laughs> so if you're like him and can do it, do it. But if you have to sacrifice, you know, artistry and musicality just to get your 11 pirouettes, it's, that doesn't count. doesn't count. Peter Barton's used to say to, say to us, don't get greedy. Do two. Don't get three and be. Don't get greedy. And he's right. He's right. Don't get greedy. Yo, even with form as well. Sometimes I see dancers who like have the arabesque up there, but they're sacrificing their line. Like their backs all crunched and it's low. And mm-hmm. you know, it looks impressive, but is it beautiful? That's no. Fun, or the it? shoulders. That, you know. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Doesn't think- count. <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, something very important to bear in mind, you know, with social media, that it's helped us a lot. But at the same time, I think it can sort of give people the wrong impression of maybe um, give unrealistic expectations of people and put a lot of pressure on young kids to feel like they have to keep up with something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For sure. Um, so... You know, I know you've also talked, you know, when you talk about your weight gain and things, you've also been Mm -hmm. very upfront about the fact that, you know, to be a dancer, you have to look a certain way and to be in a certain shape. Um, What is your, what's your take on body image in ballet now? Do you still feel like, I mean, obviously you have to be in shape, but you know, yeah, it's I mean, still it's, the thing it's with. an aesthetic art, and that's that's the thing is that pe- we can talk about all day long. Well, this that it's still an aesthetic art, so you have to have a certain shape for it. Um, I think we're getting m- more f- away from the super thin, crazy, and more into the healthy athletic, but it's still there. Um, companies still expect thin, but I think nowadays people, especially company directors, are much more aware of. Let's keep the dancers healthy. Let's provide injury prevention. Let's, you know, let, let's do everything we can to help them instead of, well, be thin. I don't care how you do it. You know, right. we're not, I don't think we're there anymore, which is good. Um, but it's still an aesthetic art, you know, and as, as, even for all the struggles I have had, I, I knew that for a very long time I was not at professional quality because it's still, you need that certain look. You don't have to be super stick thin, but I think we're still dealing with it even more so now because, again, going back to Instagram, 
Yeah. You know, I think all these kids are seeing, instead of just, because when I was little, all the, the dancers I saw were the dancers in the magazines, the principal dancers, and the people I was in the studio with. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have Instagram. Now all these kids are seeing these people from everywhere with feet and legs and who are this big around and just, now they're just being bombarded with it. You know, if they weren't in Point or Dance Magazine, I didn't really know about certain dancers. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> or when I went to a summer course, it was like, who are all these people, you know? Whereas they meet up on Instagram now before they even get there. So I think while we are in this place of there's more awareness and it's more health-based, it might be even worse now because of social media, honestly. I think um, that's like these a... 12 yeah. I think there's like a dip dichotomy where I feel like ballet is slowly and I would like to shift it more to having a bit more the way of acceptance of different kinds of like body shapes as opposed to you have to look this way. But at the same time, there's this whole other thing on Instagram where, yeah, the girls are very, some you see some girls who are very, very thin and maybe some of them naturally mm-hmm. look like that, you know, but not everybody yeah. does. And what you don't see is what people do behind the scenes to achieve that, which may not necessarily be very healthy. Absolutely. And <clears throat> it's it's such a tricky topic because there's no perfect answer. There's no, I mean, even I did notice that, you know, being a judge this year at YGP, there were different body types. Um, and even with, especially I can totally now speak for Miami City Ballet, there are lots of different body types. I actually find that I fit in very well down there. I am not a stick, probably will never be a stick. I never was a stick. Um, I was never the thinnest one in the room. And the ironic thing for me now at Miami is I'm one of the taller dancers, which... Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I walked in and I was like, oh, this is good. Because <laughs> like, I'm much more suited to taller people's rep than the short, fast, jumpy people. But um, So that's it changes company to company, too. I was short at City Ballet. I'm tall at Miami. P&B, you know, notoriously, they have a lot of taller dancers. Ballet West has taller dancers. So I think it also depends on the company um, as to the different body types and different heights. But, um, yeah, it's still a tricky topic. It's still a tricky topic no matter where you go. And there is a standard. There is a standard. It's, especially. It's, inter- it's interesting. And I think, like, you know, we could probably spend, like, two hours talking about this, but we don't have time. But, you know, when we say ballet is an aesthetic art, like, who this, you know, who this dictates the aesthetic? Like, who is it for? Because as our culture is changing and, you know, the way we look at body is changing, body image is changing now. We know it's not like the 90s where, like, heroin chic was in. Mm-hmm. You know, now Absolutely. it's like the episode of athletic. Um, so, like, as audience members, I hope, I hopefully it would think that people's minds have changed where we don't expect to see those kind of dances on stage anymore. So, then who is really expecting that sort of aesthetic, you know? It's, it, that's a very good point because is it, like, all the fellow dancers, like, we have to look like the heroin chic I don't know is it certain company directors I don't know um I know Balanchine was very famous for wanting the the stick thin but even but then there was like Suzanne Farrell who was thin but she had a womanly butt you know so there's still always the exceptions to the rule so I don't know it's a very good question yeah I mean that's that's the thing that's something that occurred to me like who 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 was actually placing these aesthetic demands and why and you know isn't it like a like a vicious cycle that if you keep putting skinny dancers on stage, then that's just what audiences are conditioned to. So mm-hmm. when they see something different, they'll be like, oh, that's different, you know? Yes. But it, So it's kind of like a vicious cycle and like the change has to come from somewhere because I also feel like, you know, if you're dancing, what food professional you're doing six, seven days a week, six hours a day, mm-hmm. you know, dancing or rehearsing or conditioning, like you're probably in the best shape of your life and to have Absolutely. to feel like you have to do even more to get yourself even smaller. It's It's a fine line. I mean, we have one of our teachers at SAB, Susie Pilar, who I love her so much. She once said to us, you have such a hard job because you have to have the strength, the endurance, and and work as hard as an athlete. But you have to look like, you have to look like a model. Yeah. Models walk up and down. They, they're fine. You have to literally play football looking like a model. And I was yeah. like, yeah, it's so hard. Is There's that tricky balance of having to have the right amount of energy and endurance and muscles while still looking effortless. And, you know, even it's like like football players can grunt and sweat and everybody's like, oh, they're working hard. Ballerinas can't look like they grunt and no, sweat. No, no, it's, it's, you know? <laughs> you're, like, you're doing like a 
Grow an allegro <laughs> and you gotta smile and make it look like it's yeah, all make it look like I do this all day long. You know, well, this is so easy. I'm it's so, so easy. Yeah, and then you're like, I'm dying. It hurts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I'll never forget when she said that because, and that has kind of stuck with me. And that's why ballet is so hard. Can you yeah. have to do both? You have to be everything, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just, oh, I don't know how you guys do it. To be honest, I it's, don't know how you guys. Do it. It's tough it's t- i mean but but i will say part of actually being on a company schedule that does keep you in shape up yeah. until i had my illness i really didn't struggle with keeping my weight down i was never still going to be the thinnest one in the room but i didn't have to starve because we were eating i mean we were dancing all day long so yeah. you do enough exercise to kind of you know to stay in that kind of shape if you just eat properly um so you, i never had to starve my illness was a whole other thing. But what I like to tell people who are non-dancers who don't have a clue about what ballet is, I'm like, okay, imagine you are in the gym for 10 hours a day, six days a week in a bathing suit. Yeah. That's what it is. That's literally what it is. <laughs> and do your best work at 8 p.m. Yeah. Because that's when the show is. So, you know, it's so hard. It's so yeah, hard. I mean, but I think I, I mean, I've said this before and I try to tell this to like, my friends who are dancers that like as an audience member my way I look at it is not I don't really care how high the arabesque is I don't care how skinny you are in a leotard or not I would rather see like a healthy dancer who with a most important with a performance that moves me you know yes for sure that's, I think as an audience member that's what you want to see more than anything else and that is because that's what moves you and that that's what makes you want to go back and watch it again it's right. not how a dancer looked or how perfect they were. It was how you, f- how their performance made you feel. Mm-hmm. For sure. For sure. And um, so how are you managing your hypothyroidism now? Is it <clears> an issue? It's not actually. I mean, since I got that result, um, I still am aware of it, but I'm off all medication, surprisingly enough. The medication actually was not helping me. I think with the autoimmune aspect of it, <clears throat> it's more about managing stress and your diet, and I think the gluten, the no gluten has actually really helped me with this. Um, right. Speaking from experience, what works for me, because you have to be careful about that nowadays on the internet, you have to say, what works for me, if you have hypothyroid issues, oh, I've gotten creamed for that before. Well, you don't speak for everyone else. Anyway, what <laughs> helps me, quote, is the no gluten and just being, you know, careful. I eat pretty much everything in moderation, just without the gluten. Yeah. Um, some people have a dairy problem. I don't have a dairy problem, but and then just honestly managing stress because stress can really affect. Oh and it's yeah. It's so hard. It's oh yeah. So hard. But I think one of the things that I was tested for was I had adrenal fatigue. I had all kinds of crazy stress issues just from yeah. being in that environment. So yeah. I'm just aware of it. Um, and it's just about day to day managing now. And I'm I'm not on any medication, which is. Amazing. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And um, just to finish off, I just want to ask a couple of quick questions, which is, one, what are your dream roles that you would love to dance? Oh, dream roles. Let's role. put it okay. out there. <clears throat> All the directors, pay attention. Yeah, men on, for sure. Um, love that ballet. I'd also like to do full length with Mill and Juliet. I think oh, that, yeah. I've done, I've done the balcony, but I have never done the full length. That's um, a beautiful beautiful piece in terms of Balanchine and Robbins Balanchine I love to do one of the principles in Serenade I learned it never did it I love to do Pink Girl in Dances at a Gathering learned it never did it um just I'm I'm the lyrical like oh Giselle full length Giselle that's number one probably actually Mm -hmm. um I did act two but I haven't done act one um just you know as much as I can now uh just I'm not a (laughs) I'm not a spin on your head, tear and tell a fast kind of girl. <laughs> I just don't work. Um, so anything that's slow and dramatic and lyrical. And I'd love to someday have a full length choreographed on me. I think a lot of dancers want that to happen, but um, that would be lovely. Any, Some dr- any, any dramatic. Any choreographers on the bucket list? Anybody. I mean, Wilden, Scarlett, Brett Mansky, Justin Peck, any of them. Any of them. Um, and then, yeah, so those would probably be the dream roles. That's a lot. But and at this point, I'm just happy to do anything, yeah. you know. So. And then um, I think I'd like to finish off with one question, which is um, what advice would you like to give to your younger self, if any? Oh, 
to my younger self, knowing what I've been through. Yes. It's not going to be an easy path, Katie, but it's special. And you're going through it for a reason, and you're going to have a unique story to tell once you get there. And it's going to be a lot hard. Well, it's going to start off, because everybody that's the one thing about being on the Internet. I get a lot, not to digress from this. But people yeah. will often come up to say, I didn't dance Juliet by 17, so I must be failing. I'm like, okay, don't compare yourself to my story because guess what? At 22, I quit. So yeah. you can't compare yourself to other people's story, stories. Um, so just take it one day at a time. Appreciate it because I think that's looking back on my time at New York City Valley, that's the one regret I have is that I wish I had enjoyed it more because I was yeah. so stressed out and working so hard and trying to just – be the best at everything, which is impossible, yeah. that I forgot to enjoy it a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So enjoy it and just know that, you know, your path is meant for you for a reason. Yes. So hard. I think that's hard to, <laughs> hard to deal easy, with. It, easier said than done, but, when you, but you know, it's, that's part of the process of it's mm -hmm. learning, isn't it? Yes. Well, um, I think I had a... I had a really enjoyable time chatting to you and I'm sure that everybody oh, as well you. listening in um, will enjoy hearing what you have to say and all your little truth nuggets and hearing oh, about your journey. You. And thank I think we're so all much. very excited for the next stage of your journey and I wish you incredible amount of success because I think you deserve it. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed listening to what Katie had to say and of course big thank you to Katie for making the time to talk to me. I wanted to interview her for oof, a really long time, so I'm so glad we made it happen. If you have any comments or questions or feedback that you would like uh, me to know, feel free to leave it in the comments. I'd love to know what you guys thought. And if there's anybody who you want me to interview in the future for the Cloud of Victory blog, of course, feel free to let me know as well. Just leave a note in the comments. I hope you have a great day. Keep rocking out your CNV dancewear. If you don't have any CNV dancewear, you know, just head over to cloudandvictory.com. Um, if you sign up for email list letter, you get 10% off your first order. So yay! Um, keep dancing. Most importantly, keep dancing with joy. And of course, please keep reaching for that pizza. Thanks, guys. And um, I'll see you at the next interview. Bye!